Opal's cat! <laughs> okay, so how do you take this stuff off? If you've bought it or you have it, how do you take it off? So the back one goes down loosely. Now you've washed your hands, okay? No gloves on, you've washed your hands. And the top one, you take off very gently. And this goes into the garbage or it goes into bleach water if you have to reuse them. Don't reuse them unless you have to. Don't breathe, don't talk while you're taking off the face mask. So if you didn't see the uh, donning video where you put this stuff on, you might want to watch that. This is actually how to take it off. It's based upon a hospital video. I break the hospital video down into segments and I interject my own thoughts and my own theories where I find it's appropriate. I am not an IPNC nurse or doctor. I am a registered nurse with a large background in trauma care. I did work extensively with SARS patients in ICU in 2003. I'm currently an administrator on nights. I'm the only manager on nights for a major trauma hospital and we are preparing for COVID-19. And so should you at home. The doffing process poses the highest risk of transmission to healthcare workers. SARS in 2002-2003 killed less than a thousand people globally. It killed Canadian nurses and reusing the yellow gowns was implicated heavily in their transmission. Make sure to take your time removing your personal protective equipment. A guide will be posted in the anteroom outlining the steps of PPE removal for staff. That's a great idea. I recommend you do the same thing. Whatever equipment you're using, whether it's improvised or personal protective, write down the steps to put it on, write down the steps to take it off. Don't be breaking the chain that's in this video. If you do that, you are risking self-contamination, specifically whilst taking it off. Please refer to this guide when doffing your PPE. Step into the anteroom and ensure the doors close behind you. Remove gloves using the glove-to-glove -glove and skin-to-skin -skin technique. Place in the garbage. Or in a strong bleach solution because you might have to be forced to reuse equipment rather than have no equipment. You may perform hand hygiene at this time if there is any concern your hands became contaminated during glove removal. Unless you literally just walk in the room and walk out and the doors are automatic. If you have to use the door and you just walk in the room for five seconds and walk out again, you shouldn't have gone in in the first place. But wash your hands every time. Don't skip this step. I don't think there's any need to go, I don't have contaminated gloves or hands, I'm fine. Don't ever think that. Next, untie the gown around your waist and at the neck. Grab the straps from the back of the neck and slowly pull the gown forward and peel it away from you, touching only the inside of the gown. Be careful not to let the gown touch your clothes. Roll the gown into a ball. Highly arguable. If you are going to roll it into a ball, for sure wash your hands after you've done it. What you don't want to do is wave it. Uh, you don't want to throw it on the floor. Tuberculosis TB, one of the main transmission routes in hospitals used to be nurses putting linens on the floor. The virus would get on the floor and then it would be kicked up and become airborne. That's why today old nurses will very much scold young nurses for just dumping stuff on the floor. The old ways of infection control are gone. Place the reusable gown in the laundry hamper. Disposable or not, make sure that you're not having to touch the lids to open any of this stuff. You might actually want to open the lids in advance of going in the room if you need to, but be aware of the fact that there are contaminated products in the bin. Again. Where am I? What am I doing? What's the risk? Make an efficient assessment. What's the safest thing to do? If you are using a disposable gown, dispose of it in the garbage. Perform hand hygiene for 15 seconds. Again, this is evidence-based. Again, I'm saying 20 seconds. Remove the face shield by grabbing the strap at the back of your head. Slowly remove it down and away from your face using the sniff position. And then do exactly the same if you've got goggles. If you've only got goggles, and that's fine, in my opinion, if it's airborne, you should only have goggles and maybe a face shield. Face shields are for the droplet. Okay? Goggles are for... Anyway, same technique for goggles. Bend forward, eyes forward, chin out. Dispose of the face shield into the garbage. Remove your N95 mask. If at any time you think you may have sticky red jam on your hands from contamination, 
stop what you're doing, do a 15 or a 20 second hand wash. Don't be afraid to take your time. This is going to be very time consuming and very hard on your hands. You might want to get some really high end hand cream for nighttime use. Without touching the exterior part of the mask, again using the sniff position. Remove one strap at a time, starting with the bottom strap first and removing the top strap last. Remove the straps by grasping them from the back of your head. Dispose of the N95 respirator in the garbage. Perform hand hygiene. Rooms with anti-rooms are the preferred accommodation for patients under airborne droplet and contact precautions. We don't have enough for a major pandemic. So we'll be using single rooms and then eventually we'll be using shared rooms with blankets in between if we have enough cases. We can't just stop giving care and if we only are set up to give the maximum safest care, if we suddenly get faced with jumping of caseload, that's going to be my major job is to actually get people to be flexible in ways that are perfect but are better than just crisis and trying to fix it. If there is no anteroom, remove all PPE inside the patient room at the doorway. And that of course is going to be the case for almost 99% of people doing this at home. If you or your loved one or a child is infected or has the signs of infection, it could just be normal flu, remember. There's going to be a lot of fear here. Anything is going to be seen as COVID-19 that you may not be able to have an anteroom. But what you do is if you're nursing them, you want to make sure they have a dedicated toilet. If you can't get them a dedicated toilet, make sure they've got a dedicated bucket in the room. You absolutely don't want them sh walking around. You want them contained. And when you go in that contained room, you take all the precautions of putting the stuff on, donning, that's been in the other video. And when you finish, you take all the precautions of doffing that's in this video. The only difference here is that when you are designing your quarantine area inside your own home, or in a garage, whatever, you want to make sure that if you don't have an anteroom, construct a partial one. Anterooms are designed to keep the pressure in the room lower than the external pressure, so air flows into the room, not out of the room, because we don't want the virus floating out of the room. If it's droplet, there's no major need for that. A single room's just fine. If it's airborne, you absolutely have to have negative pressure. We might not be able to provide that. You probably definitely can't provide that in your own home. So think about that. If it's an upstairs room or a downstairs room, try and find a room that has a short corridor. Put up one or two pieces of plastic tape that fits. If you can, put a little slice in it so when you go in, you don't touch it. But remember that every time you go in and out of those plastic sheet barriers, use a bleach solution on both sides of it, one rag at a time, into the reuse pile, to further bleach to be machine hot washed. So anything that you're contaminating yourself with onto those screens is removed. The other thing is you'll notice shoes. Shoes aren't really focused on, though I did notice we bought a whole pile of disposable slippers at my hospital, which is new for us. We don't give them to people. We don't even give you a toothbrush. Canadian healthcare, right? But the idea here would be uh, that you can use plastic bags. I'm going to put up a little clip from Wuhan City showing the absolute devastation in Wuhan City. There's now about 30,000 pets that have been abandoned there or people can't get back into Wuhan City and there are volunteers going out every day to feed and water and look after those pets. Mo 
that hopefully will happen here as well. People really need to start coming up with a pet plan. If I'm separated from my pet, is the pet able to access toilet bowls for water? Do I have enough water in the house that they won't die in two weeks? They can starve for a little while, but you know, consider that when you go out, you may not be able to come back. Start to think about ways to increasing your pet supply of food and water. With the exception of the N95 respirator, which must be removed in the hallway. So it's pretty straightforward. N95 is the first thing to go on and it is the last thing to come off. And it is never removed in the same physical room as a person that may be contaminated. It's worth watching this. It's worth grabbing a pen and writing on a writing on the wall, writing on a piece of paper and putting on the wall the actual steps that you would do, taking it on, taking it off, and putting it somewhere you can see it. And if you don't have a second person that's going to be available to you to check what you've done is in the right order and put on correctly, you might want to consider placing a full length mirror close to the area that you're actually doing this in. The anteroom used here is faked. Our anterooms are very, very, very small. Um, if we have any empty beds at some point in the future, I might actually show you what a negative pressure room is actually like. Obviously, I won't be filming inpatient care units, um, so I'd have to find somewhere that's actually shut down. And we usually have nowhere shut down because it's usually pretty busy all the time. So stay safe out there. Think about your pets. Think about your own safety. Be relaxed about this. But if you've gone out there and bought N95s or N99 or N100s or goodness help me, gas masks, which are very hard to take off without contaminating yourself, very hard. Give it serious thought. Like, now I've got this gear, can I actually put it on and off? You know, designate one of your N95, if you've only got two, as a practice N95. And you can use this in your pocket when you're out and about on the street and not planning to shop. Maybe you're going for a walk with the dog. So you can slam this one on if somebody's coming too close to you, okay? So think about this. Now you will notice that I did write on this. Um, in This is a joke, I don't care about subs. In SARS, we actually did this all the time and people, we had the white masks, now they put these labels on them, but when they actually are running out of stock and they're doing this really quickly, you'll find these labels are gonna disappear. That's what happened in SARS. And people would actually do lipstick on there and all sorts of things. IPNC, Infection Prevention Control, really hated us doing that. Uh, they claimed that it would actually cause a break in the barrier, the seal. Um, I'm not convinced it would. What I do know is it helped us hugely to have some humor in the middle of dealing with SARS. And I really encourage people to make sure that they can deal, if we have to, with a major outbreak of COVID-19 with at least good humor. And remember, support the people who are trying to help you. Don't start fighting them. Don't start demanding stuff. It's not going to go down well in a massive outbreak. So take care. If you've got any comments on this video, if you think I'm saying stuff wrong, please tell me. Uh, I have no problems with that at all as long as you don't just start insulting me or other commentators specifically. This is supposed to be interactive as it can be. I'm doing this for the goodness of my heart, not for the couple of books I'm getting from YouTube, and I'm not selling your products. Um, I'm just appalled that people are actually taking money for videos on this topic, and they don't seem to have any plans for buying equipment and randomly giving it to their subscribers, or giving it to charities, etc., etc., or even donating it to the local hospital. They're just making profit from your fear. And you've got to be very, very careful of that. People are going to say the most outrageous things, show the most outrageous videos, talk about them out of context, because fear sells. The other thing that sells is the feeling of superiority. I've got colored silver. I'm going to be just fine. Yeah, right. Don't buy safety. Don't buy safety now, and don't buy safety all the time. Or I will send you Becky to look after. Toodles. It's a Bad Terrier 2020 production.